we went through a brief period of bioluminescence. Yeah. So it was pretty funny that I had to come on this uh, the Nautilus ship and <laughs> go a couple hundred meters down below to see bioluminescence, but it's, it's still an incredible uh, thing they, to see. They used to have this like little dinosaur, and a friend bought me it once for a birthday present. Is this plastic dinosaur, and you, they actually shipped you dinoflagellates. And so you put the dinoflagellates in the water in it, and you had food to feed your dinoflagellates. And when you shook it, it glue due to the bioluminescence. So I had that for a year, and then eventually the thing got stuck, and I couldn't open it to feed it anymore. <laughs> so, but yeah, and then I looked to try and see and get more, and they don't do it anymore. But yeah, you used to be able to buy a dino, dino with dinoflagellates in it and have like a bioluminescent light night. That's, that's awesome. Um, it's funny how there's parallels between the terrestrial and the marine world. Um, so bioluminescence by dinoflagellates, it occurs by these two um, chemical cues. And so fireflies is the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's pretty interesting how it's, I think it's luciferin and it, luciferase. Yes. Yeah, Luciferase and that chemical is makes, the enzyme. Exactly, yeah, so that chemical reaction is what causes this bioluminescence, bioluminescence. yeah. It's I think animals can do it two different ways. Like anglerfish have bacteria mm -hmm. in their little lure, and the bacteria is what's doing the bioluminescence, whereas things like fireflies or lanternfish actually have cells with the enzyme that can bioluminesce. Yeah. So it's very fun how, like... Animals have evolved different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah. We have a comment in the chat um, that the unstocked crinoids, the feather stars, those are gripping onto the rocks with many arms. And yeah, I think it's called Siri. I don't know if I, C-I-R-R-I. I remember is, is the name of the appendage that they use the crinoids to hold on to the rock, I believe, if I'm correct or not. I'm not positive. Do you know on that? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm actually not too sure. Maybe a little quick Google search yeah. would help out. Zach, do you know the name of the appendage that crinoids grip onto it? Is it called Suri? I have that in my head for some reason. But the, how they clip onto the bottom? Yeah. Oh, I do not know the term off the top of my head. I think, I, I don't know why I have it as, when I teach my students about yeah. it. I have it fixed in my head, but I don't know if it's right. Let's Google crinoid anatomy. Oh, they actually? I know they, they have. They call it a hold fast, too. Hold fast, too, which same is like, as the seaweed. Yeah, it's like yeah, marine algae, plants, yeah. right? And then. I wonder if we do feather star anatomy, if we get a different answer then. So yeah, this one <laughs> calls it, oh, C-I-R-R-U-S. Yeah, and that's like the, basically another for the stock, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So I think like so the, the feather fast. star with the stock has a hold fast. Yeah. Or the crinoid with the stock, or the uh, sea lily, that's another name for it. Uh -huh. Whereas the feather star is one that's free floating and doesn't have the stock. So instead of a hold fast, it's called a, Cirrus. Cirrus? Yeah. I don't know how to pronounce it. Someone also said they've always wanted one of those dinos as a kid. It is pretty fun. I tried it. I looked into it to see if I could get one from my classroom, mm. but they don't sell them anymore. Yeah, I've never heard of that. The only dinos that I uh, remember when I was a kid was like those foam or gelatin ones where you add water and oh, the yeah, dinosaur yeah, would expand. expand.
Yeah, I just asked Jonathan if he if he shut that if the if he shut the triclops down. Not sure. It happened like right as he left, so. Huh. It's very interesting. Apparently, you can still find them on eBay, according to our chat. Mm -hmm. Dino pet on eBay. The dino flagellates? The dino flagellate glow. Oh, my message yeah. to see. Oh. Yeah. I wonder if they if still have the... If it doesn't respond, maybe we can run down there in a minute, but... Mm. It looks like it's facing backwards now. Interesting. Oh, okay, yep. Yeah. There it is. Oh. Looks almost as if the right uh, fish eye lens doesn't have the uh, the it, thing that was dangling. It's on, on it. there in the corner. Oh, ah, so okay. You can just yeah. see it's moved a little bit more off to the side, but it's still, mm. still hanging on no, there. No, I think mm. our, our hitchhiker got off about half an hour ago. I, I think I still see it, though. I think that's the robotic arm. Oh. You think that's the robotic arm? <laughs> I think that's the side of the robotic arm. Oh. I was thinking we are going to mm. get some biological sample here <laughs> this way. Yeah, I really think uh, Jonathan would appreciate if the sea slug was our mascot. <laughs> <laughs> So why do you think our um, dominant animals here are, are those feather stars, our crinoids versus more so coral? Is it just because of the bottom type? Yeah, it could be because of um, the substrate that's there. Um, could be a preference for certain food particulates. Um, there might be some, some kind of distribution of food particles that favor one species over the other. Um, yeah, there's just like there's just so much more information that we could gather. Um, sadly, for this um, research transect, we're only getting the photos, so there's only so much information you actually pull. Um, where right now we can only just examine the trends of species distribution using the photos and the 3D photogrammetry. We'd have to take more um, water samples, biological material to understand that precise mechanism. Lots of people are putting into the chat. Apparently, you can buy a mushroom-shaped dinoflagellate aquarium. Things you can buy online. Well, out of all things you can buy online, as long as our viewers are not buying corals online, you know, I don't want nobody, uh, hopefully nobody's out there supporting the coral trade out there. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about the coral trade? Yeah, so um, people who are amateur or maybe professional, um, I don't know what the word is, aquarist, like if you have a specific tank and you like to have corals and grow them and see them for your aesthetics, um, it's really driven up the coral trade. So places like in the Indo-Pacific, 
uh, which we refer to as the um, coral triangle, where there's like the highest abundance of corals and of course species diversity of corals there too. Those corals are taken uh, from their habitat, typically through destructive means, um, which lowers the species diversity. Um, and in that transit, um, many corals are lost within that transit. So um, out of, I don't know, I don't know, out of a thousand or a hundred corals that are being transported, only a small few will actually get to the end results. And um, yeah, it's had negative effects. Um, it was something we actually spoke about in one of my, my classes. We were talking about how the movie Nemo actually um, caused some serious harm to that specific fish because after that mo movie, many people wanted to have Nemo in their fish tanks. Yeah. And so you have fishermen out there gathering all these um, specific kinds of fish, uh, which, you know, brings down that population. Um, and yeah, so also deep sea corals are not, uh, are also affected too because of the, the jewelry trade as well. Um, we have a question in the chat if we have a geologist on the shift. Oh, do we have? <laughs> I don't think anyone's a geologist on this shift. Mm -hmm. So I think Larry's our tend to go to geologists on board. Yeah, yeah. Out of curiosity, what's the question? They just asked if there's a geologist on the shift. That was oh. the question. Okay. So <laughs> I'm guessing they have a geology question, but we'll probably not ask us because we don't we don't have one on board. You're welcome to ask, and we can try and see if we can <laughs> find the answer for you. Maybe I'll... Yeah, I'm I'll sure Professor Google might yeah, know the answer. <laughs> I, can, I can text Larry in our WhatsApp group to ask him the question. I think we're a little biology heavy on this shift. Here's a little pop quiz question for everyone. Can anyone name all the layers of the ocean? No. I like, uh, so I teach this to my students and I actually have an acronym for it um, to help them remember the layers of the ocean. So our acronym is everyone must bathe at home. So you start off with epipelagic for everyone, mesopelagic for must, bathypelagic for bathe, A is for abyssal, and then you have um, home, which is the hadopelagic zone. Everyone must bathe at home. I actually had a student who came up with that, and I thought it was great, and ever since then I've always used that acronym to help me teach the different layers of the ocean. Daniela, do you know what layer we're at now? I believe we're, let's see, what's our depth right now? We're at 883 meters. So I believe this is the mesopelagic zone.
have a message from at home talking about how um, different sources where you can get dinoflagellates, but talked about how it's much harder to get them because some are toxic, and that is very true. Dinoflagellates are also responsible for red tides, which um, release a uh, toxin and kills a lot of fish too. So dinoflagellates can be really beautiful, but also very deadly. So I noticed uh, how different everything is from the very lower, you know, where it's yeah. much more volcanic, hard rock. Now it's really a lot of sediment. And I don't know, you can maybe chime in here, but uh, it's just vastly different as we went up this rock face, kind of opposite of how I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I thought it was going to be more silty at the bottom and more rock at the top. And, it, you know, so I guess you never know what know how it's going to be yeah that earlier question if you've ever been surprised by what you yeah. see in there and definitely thought it'd be the reverse yeah i totally agree um i don't know about much about the geological framework of how this distributed but i can say that for sure the species um, that we saw in the beginning um, for sure per, uh, preferred a more complex environment. Um, we're not seeing too much right now because of all the silt and stuff. Yeah, I was also quite surprised when we, we started our dive today on the, those pillow basalt uh, features. I was thinking we, maybe we'll end up with mud, but that, that was really cool down hey, there. Hey, Kristen, uh, can you just record? I'm going to stop taking photos. I wonder if we're in a Thank little you. saddle here uh, that's led to some uh, sediment accumulation. We were looking at the, the bathy files on the dive planning. It looked like there was a, a little inflection point in the slope. But uh, yeah, who knows? We'll see if uh, we can get back into some of those more interesting features um, later on. One of the previous dive tracks sort of seemed like they turned around right around this point and then headed back down slope. <laughs> so uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps for a similar reason. Um, Dan, I have a question. Someone asked, how long is this dive? Are we still scheduled ROVs back on deck at 8? We are still scheduled for ROVs back on deck at 8. So. So yes, so the dive should be what? Uh, went down at 10, 10 yeah. this morning, uh, about 10.30. Uh, so I don't know how long. So that'll be almost 10 hours. And then Travis, here's a, another question for you. Question regarding coral acquisition from a home hobby aquarius perspective. How can I be sure that the fish plant or corals I'm looking at are from an ethical, sustainable source. So Ignacio was talking about uh, coral trade earlier. Yeah, so I think one of the things that's really interesting about the marine aquarium hobby industry these days and something that has really changed um, even in, in the past you know, 10, 15 years is that you can now get all of your, almost all of your organisms uh, aquacultured so you can get uh, you know farmed corals aquacultured fish uh, there's even folks that are sourcing their live rock by taking rock uh, from land and then seeding it with living rock um, sort of by basically pla placing it near a reef for uh, some amount of time so yeah I think that's one of the things that's pretty interesting and if you're sort of in the aquarium hobby industry or you know looking at setting up your your own tank, like definitely check out 
uh, aquacultured options for for any of your uh, tank stocking. Yeah, I know Hawaii has been having a big issue with illegal aquarium trade due to it having a, a very rich biodiversity and you have some species of fish that you don't see anywhere else in the world. So our Department of Land and Natural Resource has been really trying to crack down on that and has made collecting fish for aquariums illegal. I think you can do it for personal use, but you can't do it for commercial collection. Yeah, and that's certainly something that I've heard stories of, like pretty much worldwide, and l like many places that, you know, sort of the exporting of natural resources and the over-exporting of natural resources can lead to, you know, overuse, over-harvesting and, and local harm. And so that's something certainly to be cognizant of when, you know, sort of uh, setting up a home aquarium. And again, for me, I think that's the part that's really cool now is that you can get, you know, aquacultured fish and corals, and uh, there's sort of a thriving sort of trade. And so, you know, theoretically, you could have a, this industry at some point running without any any local capture, which I think would be really cool. And it's sort of a you know a shift that's certainly possible. Um, uh, you know, whether the industry you know goes there is, is another question. Dan, Jonathan, um, we had a question here. It says, have we ever found human remains? Like, I know we've dove some World War II sites that were active burial grounds and were treated with respect. But besides that, I don't think there have been, has there? Well, I, I can say typically, I don't think human remains, you know, you, you see like leather or boots or that type of stuff that doesn't, you know, won't be eaten. But just like the whale, we talked about the whale yeah. thing where, everything is consumed so first it goes you know like for the whales they eat the flesh and that type of stuff and then you're left with the bones and then the worms come in and do the bones so uh, nature is very good at using up every single bit of nutrients that's yeah. down there so just like with the whale in a year and a half there will be no evidence yeah of and it, humans so. are a lot smaller than whales so it's, it's just nature's way of it's using every bit of thing that falls just like the corals what are they doing they're taking all this nutrients is falling from the top and they're sucking it up and using every bit of that energy. It's how just how nature maximizes Circle you know, of life. <laughs> the energy in the world. We are all part of the carbon cycle. Yes. Yeah, and just so sort of building on that a little bit, the there's some interesting work on the, the role of whales in, in regulating global climate, just with the sheer oh amount yeah, of... with their poop. Yeah, with <laughs> their poop, and then whale carcasses themselves. So they're exporting a ton of carbon to the deep sea, and and the vast majority of that carbon is all remineralized uh, somewhere in the deep sea, and very little of it actually gets stored in the sediment. Um, turns out uh, carbon's a hot commodity on this planet in our oceans, and so... Well, that's rapidly taken up, but uh, if it's in the deep sea, we can have that sort of accumulation of carbon down there that's been basically removed from the atmosphere by phytoplankton and whales pooping it down into the deep sea and, and out of our atmosphere. So It's all part of we, that we call that process of carbon being moved down into the deeper part as part of the biological pump. So it's pumping carbon from our surface waters to our deep sea waters, which is a carbon sink. And it can store carbon down there for hundreds to thousands of years. And so this is really important for climate change, global warming. It's keeping that carbon from going up into our atmosphere. Yeah, super cool. Um, but also one of the reasons why it can be difficult to find uh, remains of things, just because yeah. it's being scavenged and uh, recycled so quickly. We have a question in the chat saying, um, what is the largest animal that you've seen? So, 
I'm just new to this, and this is only my third day, so I think the goosefish is my largest one I've seen, but we do have footage of a <laughs> sperm whale. Has anyone else seen, what? what's the largest thing you've seen, Dan? Oh, uh, this is, you know, uh, I've only seen fish. You've so, only seen you know, fish? Fish are the biggest thing that I've seen down here, you know, looking through the cameras. Yeah. It's very rare to see a whale, well, you know, yeah. that kind of stuff. Just, they yeah. like to be on their own, and, you know, that's that stuff. Jonathan, is that sperm whale footage, the highlight, is that the only whale we've ever seen? That's the only whale that I'm aware of, yeah. Uh, we have seen them quite a bit on the surface, yeah. of course, as we're traveling through, but that whale was an absolutely spectacular and very rare view. It's also probably one of our most requested highlight videos from other production houses. Um, I believe uh, that whale footage is actually going to appear in one of the landmark BBC documentaries coming up again. So. It's uh, it's quite remarkable to have seen it at depth, yeah. um, like that. Uh, one of the only video recordings of that known. And then I know there's some footage of sharks too. Those are kind of our oh yeah, sharks. Ones. Sharks are where we're at. Yeah. So look at this. We got a compliment saying that we're doing a great job keeping it interesting, everyone. Thank you. So while we're taking a break for calibration, you know, we may want to let them know why we're here. Um, because essentially in 2011, uh, they were able to do, we, we had a manned submarine that went up through here and essentially photographed the area. So back when, 12, 13 years ago, we had a record of what, you know, what does coral look like there? So one of the reasons why we're taking this exact track is to try to go over the exact place and then years later say what's the difference that has happened. And that's so. kind of what Ignacio's research is, right? You're comparing the historical data to our current data, right? Exactly, yeah. By comparing these, uh, the previous, the, the 2011 data and data we're collecting now, we can determine how much has changed in biodiversity. And maybe any formations as well, um, in the complexity as well. Do you think the method of like, so 2011 was done by a sub and we're using an ROV, do you think that's going to impact your data at all? Um, yeah, I believe so. And also the kind of equipment as well. Um, we're using really highly advanced um, video technology and we're also going to be putting Pouring this information into a photogrammetry system that'll digitize this long linear um, track. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. So how do you compensate that change for in your in your data? Yeah. Um, so once we create these models, we can import them into a different kind of software, and by overlaying them, you can see how much has changed. So almost as if you were overlapping two images to see the changes over time. It's actually a lot more simple than what it, it actually sounds. Sound yeah, simple it's at all. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like I'm like I'm not envious of your job of having to look through all this data. <laughs> Yeah, that's actually the, the great part of being on Nautilus is I've had time to actually work with this kind of data and to create these models to see how they'll come out. And again, for you guys watching at home, feel free to write into the chat. Um, go to nautiluslive.org. And um, you can type in a message into there, and we'll see it, and we'll respond to you as best we can. If you're watching on YouTube, you can't, if you write in the comments on the YouTube, we can't see it there, so we'll hop on over to Nautilus Live. And just to give everyone a little bit update on our um, depth, we're at 876 meters currently. So we're taking this time of recalibrating our cameras, checking them out, figuring out what the best setting is for that.
Jonathan, do you want to give us our viewers an update on what's going on with the camera systems? Yeah, sure. So um, we just took a little brief pause in operations while we sorted out an issue. And uh, I took the moment while we were up, because again, every second is valuable for us uh, to do a couple of uh, troubleshooting steps on our cameras, or I'm sorry, recalibration steps on our cameras. Uh, so we're going to just go back down to the deck right now. I gotta uh, refocus uh, these cameras and then we'll be ready to go. So um, we have a viewer asking, we are not heading back up yet. Um, we're just recalibrating the cameras. So that is the reason it looked blue water, but we are not ending the dive yet. We, our dive will be back up on the ship at 10. We're pretty shallow though. So I think it'll only take what, half an hour to get back to the surface from our when we start our ascent? I'll bet, I'll bet it'll be like that. Around half yeah. an hour. So we'll probably start our ascent around 9.30ish or so. Hawaii time, that is. Or sorry, not, we're up at 8, not 10. So 8, so around 7.30 we'll start our ascent. That's pretty good. One second, stand by. Thank you. Oh, that's bright. So one of the things I thought was really cool was back in back in 2011, I think they used manned submarines to do this, yeah. and now we're doing it totally automatic, right? Yeah, they so how come the shift? Well, I, I think, you know, as technology increases, we're able to do this. So once again, there's two submarines. You have Atlanta up top providing the lighting and looking down and the, the kind of the global overview, and then you have her, you know, flying very close to the bottom because of all that and able to do it. So. Now this can be done in a single ship and with, you know, totally unmanned. Has and pipe right back, so you've seen it completely live, where before it was all recorded and had to be put together. So technology has really come forward and brought this to near, essentially near real time. Has yeah, it, anyone it, had the opportunity to go down in a sub? Did you go down in a sub, Dan? Did I know about the sub? Have you ever been in a sub? In a sub, yes. Yeah. Yes, I have. Okay. How, how was that experience? I'm ready to go. Oh, it's uh, very claustrophobic. <laughs> <laughs> it's small. It's cold. Um, and you can't go to the bathroom the whole time, right? It's, it's really nice to be here in a nice climate controlled van <laughs> sitting here and uh, the high def and you don't have the water condensing. Do you, you know, ever miss it just a little bit, though? Uh, no. No. <laughs> So yeah, the use of an ROV and this um, AI technology really helps to automate this kind of process where you you, dist you take away all the initial steps of going down there with the man sub, recording this, coming back up, putting it in a software, analyzing the data, trying to make these models. What this does is it really decreases the amount of time that it takes to do all that. I mean, okay, I'm ready to go. We can record all this data and at the yep. same time create these models simultaneously. So it's really automated. Okay, here's a question. Would you rather go in a deep sea sub down to the Marianas Trench or go up in a um, spaceship to the moon? Oh. Marianas Trench. Marianas Easy. Trench. <laughs> moon. Uh, I'd go to space. Oh, I don't know. I like, I, I go ocean. I mean, to be able to see the blue planet that we're living on from outer space, yeah. I think that's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I do both. You do both? <laughs> <laughs> you can't pick one or the other? <laughs> Someone in the chat agrees with you, Dan, saying snacks delivered from the lounge ROV sounds better than a sub. <laughs> All right, calibration's complete, so we're starting to move forward towards the top of the ridge. And that's what we're really looking for, to see if there's a big colony of coral right at the top of that ridge. All right, so everyone mm -hmm. cross your fingers for us that we see some beautiful corals up there. And why is that, Anantio? Why do we look at, why do you think they're all at the top of the ridge? Yeah, so comparing it to the 2011 data, we saw images where there was a high density of corals on this ridge, and it might be due to the the way that the ridge line brings the currents forward into it, bringing along more food particles for the corals to eat. So that might be a reason why. Um, and also the substrate. 
as we're seeing right now, it's a bunch of sand, silt, not really a lot of hard substrate for corals to latch onto, which is incredibly important. Yeah, right now it's a tough environment for corals to live. So let's hope for some more rocky stuff. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, at the top of the ridge, you get a lot more current. More that hard will substrate. Bring, the, bring, that, bring that food, which is what they're looking for. So yeah. well, where, yeah. you see, where you see corals is because one, they can they can live on it, and two, there's got to be food that goes by so they can, they can essentially sustain themselves. Yeah, I think that's true for any org organism. Like where, where there's food and a place to sleep, there will be animals. I know that's what I like. <laughs> one of the reasons I love being on the Nautilus. They feed us really well. So. <laughs> feed us well and the bunks are pretty comfortable. I'm not going to lie. I've been on a lot of boats and usually boat bunks suck. <laughs> so these are very comfortable. I've been sleeping great. It's also, it also helps having a cr that, an amazing crew as well. So yes. like my bunk mate is pretty, pretty great. <laughs> <laughs> My bunk mates, my advisor, Travis. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to acknowledge that. <laughs> I was about to call you out. <laughs> you gotta get those suck up points in, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's a good way to get to know your advisor really closely. Oh, yeah. Oh, anytime you get the chance to be in the field with your advisor, you, you learn more than you'll ever expect, and, and on personal and academic ways, it's great. And it, it really. For me, I think it makes the rest of the project more fun when, when you guys become, you know, friends and buddies and doing things more than just, here's a project, do it, right? Like, yeah. Zach, I think that makes sense. it sounds like experience. you have some personal stories. Do you have any field work personal stories you can No, share I've, with I've been very lucky as well. Like, getting out in the, um, in the field with my advisor, it's, it's really helped me, honestly. Like, it, it makes everything easier. And they, you know, they understand where your questions are coming from because they were there and saw it too. And, um, yeah, I think it's a... It's a great thing. I was just, uh, when I went to grad school, um, they always told me, you know, make sure you you and your advisor are going to work well together, you know, are going to help each other. Because um, when that doesn't happen, uh, grad school is tough. <laughs> you yeah. can't do it alone. So finding a good advisor, I think, is one of the keys to it. That is definitely um, a really yeah. good key. Find a good advisor, someone you can work well with. Yeah. yeah. And you need to know that advisor, too. It helps humanize the process rather than just being like a hierarchy. It, just, it really helps to strengthen that kind of bond. So yeah. for those going through the process of applying to graduate school, how do you find a good advisor? Oh, uh, wow. If you have a school in mind and you have an advisor specifically you want to work with, I think the best thing to do is talk to people who have worked with them before and they'll tell you what their experience was like and then you can decide if that's an experience you're interested in or not. Um, if you have no idea you know, about the person or don't really have a way to get in contact with students, um, trying to set up a time to meet with them I think is, is crucial. Um, uh, I mean, during COVID things got pretty... I'm um, standing right, doing everything online and eat, meeting there, and that still works. Um, if you're able to get there in person, though, too, and, you know, and get that impression, and have that conversation, um, it just kind of sets your mood for the next couple years of school together. And it really, for me at least, I think that was one of the key things. You know, it was like from the start, it's like this is someone you know I'd like to work with, and someone that I think is going to help me. Um, and those were the things that I was personally looked for. I don't know about you, Ignacio, but that was. Yeah, that was really my thing. We'll pretend that Travis can't hear you and you're not in the same <laughs> system. Why did you pick Travis? Um, so um, let me go back a little bit. So if you really want to find out about the potential advisor, uh, a good way is to always ask the, the students within that lab. They'll tell you like on a different kind of level, like how is this person? How do they communicate? Communication is one of the key things that will really help out the master process. Um, but also word of mouth. My previous advisor in my undergraduate career told me about Dr. Courtney and mentioned like, hey, you know, like, um, you see how my lab is. It's very welcoming, very family oriented, very, uh, we like to support each other. He also has a similar lab in that kind of style. And so those are key words that you really got to pick up. It's like, yeah, I like this environment. I want to keep this going. Let me reach out to this person. And, you know, like, it's, it was really a blessing. I mean, now I'm here. And it's, it's incredible because Dr. Courtney is a supportive person. The lab that he's created is very supportive as well. And I feel like the, um, well, the research is, is very broad and um, it's very supportive that so we can all help each other out in some kind of aspect yeah. and learn from each other. So it really helps build us as scientists, which is really nice. And um, it's one of the key things is teamwork and 
I'm experiencing that here on the Nautilus. There's very diverse individuals who do different kinds of sciences, and I'm learning a whole bunch. And you know, sometimes people might notice I'm very quiet. It's just because I'm listening. Because one just of the best ways, yeah, in. one of the best ways to really learn is to just, just yeah. listen. You know, it's the best thing you can do. It's just like not interject all the time. Listen it up, and I mean, just incredible people here. You. Um, and so if ever you do find yourself looking for um, an advisor, hopefully you find the right one. And um, it's almost like finding a, a soulmate. You find somebody <laughs> who you really care about it, so you can always be good friends. So, um, Travis, and you hear that? I think you and Matthew are soulmates. Oh, I didn't realize you were on here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, this was not a paid promotion, by the way. <laughs> yeah, wow, thank you. <laughs> I, I will say that, you know, like it, when you can find when you can find an advisor you can work with, it's great, but sometimes you don't. And it's okay too. There's many other advisors, so just don't don't feel like, oh my gosh, what do I have don't to do. Don't feel like you have like, to find your soulmate. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would tell you that you can get by with you know, you can get by doing what you need to do, yeah. but when you when your advisors don't mix just, you know, find another one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like you can transfer, you can do this. You can transfer in the same university, you can transfer out of the university, um, you know, but finding the right one is a very key to your yeah. success. Yeah, yeah and be, be prepared for not instant success, whether it's finding an advisor once you get yeah. to school. I mean, that's part of the journey, right? And, you know, people, I mean, I think it's good for everybody to shoot for the stars, like find your dream advisor, reach out to them, see what happens. You know, the worst thing that happens is they say no. But better than you not asking and wondering, yeah. right? It and won't so, ever happen if you don't ask. Yeah. So I, I mean, that's my thing. I mean, I personally, I was, you know, going back to grad school. I was like, oh, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know this. And then you know, start talking with other people who worked, and they're like, yeah, try it. And I was like, okay. And it, you know, and it luckily worked out for me. Um, but you know, there's always a saying of you become the average of the five people you're around the most, right? If you're in a lab that you love and is doing what you love, you're gonna you're gonna be happy with who you become. You know, if if you find yourself taking or going. Um, with no necessary path or direction or just taking an offer because you didn't know what else to do, you might end up, you know, a year later really stressed and wondering like, oh man, I don't know how to do this because, again, grad school is a grueling couple years and you got to love what you're doing. And if you go into it not loving it, it's going to be really hard to finish it. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, that's, you know, that's just the reality of it. Um, it's not the glamour years of your life. It's, it's kind of the like taking, that, taking those couple years to really improve to get to where you want to be. Um, so... Yeah, one of my biggest pieces of advice to my seniors when they're going off into college is don't be shy. Talk to your professors. Like, go in, even if it's in a big lab or, like, big lecture and there's, like, 200 of you, make them know your face. Yeah, and yeah. Make those yeah. connections. I think that's really crucial and it's something that sort of I've, I've experienced a lot as a professor is that a lot of students just don't come to student hours yeah, and office hours there's and no things. amount of encouraging I can do <laughs> to yeah. be like come here like we can chat about anything I want to help you you know and especially you know especially if you're like struggling in a class like talk to your professor talk to your TA um, and yeah, TAs are a great resource too to utilize and even if you're not struggling you're just excited about it you know it's also really like it's really great to get positive feedback of just like, hey, I'm like, I'm really enjoying this class, like, because it takes a lot to put all that together. And one of the things that you know, I, I think everyone's kind of covered a lot of the main topics, but one of the things I have, I don't think has been covered is like, I think it's really valuable to have multiple mentors, and we often tend to focus on sort of like the primary research advisor, um, but I think you know regardless of how great they are, like if, you, if that's j the only per mentor and advisor you have, it's gonna be difficult because yeah. you know, being a human is a very dynamic experience and it's really helpful to have experience um, sort of from across the board and have people you can ask advice from or from you know, who are a little detached from that situation or who have skills in other aspects in life. And so I think that's also really valuable too and it's something that I tried to do and I still try to do is like, try to find people who are supportive and, and willing to mentor me and so that I can keep learning and growing and you know figure out how I can do yeah. my job better and including mentoring, right? So yeah. it's like you know that seeking out that constant growth and we're very uh, yeah. Humans are not islands. So, <laughs> so that's in, really in, crucial. In Puerto Rico, um, in the grad school, is it uh, like y you guys still require the couple committee members as well? Yeah. Is there like a minimum number kind of thing you have there? 
Yeah, pretty standard. Uh, a master's uh, committee is three, three yeah. of, uh, folks, and then PhD is five. Uh, so yeah. that seems to be pretty standard at yeah. a lot of the university yeah. I've been at. And um, so yeah, committee members can also be really great uh, resources. Um, sometimes they're less engaged, and you know, again, the mentors come from other other places in the department. I had, you know folks even at other institutions who weren't on my committee who gave me way more support and advice than some of my committee members did. And so, yeah, I think sort of being adaptive and yeah. sort of leveraging that, but you know, the system is, is a little bit designed to have multiple people there by default. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Otherwise, it's a lot of weight for you to burden alone as the advisor too. You got your stuff going on and yeah, as, as students, it's, it's good to have multiple places to go because if you only have one, it, it makes it hard. Travis, do you want to do a little plug for the University of Puerto Rico? Why should pe students come and study over at you guys? Yeah, sure. So the University of Puerto Rico, um, I'm at the University of Puerto Rico in Mayaguez, um, which is has about 13,000 uh, total students. There's a whole range of undergraduate uh, degrees, and I'm at the uh, Department of Marine Science, where we offer uh, Master's of Science and PhDs in biological, uh, chemical, geological, and physical marine science. Um, and so there's opportunities to specialize in any of those fields. And we have a really unique setup because we're located right in between uh, a mix of mangroves, seagrass, and coral reef ecosystems. and the shelf edge is also very close nearby, so there's lots of opportunities to access uh, different environments. And uh, Puerto Rico is a, a lovely place, a, a very beautiful island, and um, lots of really great folks there. So uh, I've really enjoyed uh, my time there so far. Uh, so yeah, I think um, whether it's Puerto Rico or anywhere else, like one of the things that was really helpful for me was you know, branching out and finding new experiences and new places and see how, how folks do things uh, elsewhere and sort of stepping outside of my my home comfort zone and yeah trying something new uh, I think that's also um, yeah a, a really big part of learning and also part of science because science is all about doing new things and doing things that you know no one has done before and that we don't really know yeah. uh, otherwise there'd be r no real point in doing this if, if we weren't trying to discover something new and find out something new Zach, do you want to tell us about the University of Hilo? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, I, so actually, what's that? I have a student that she really wants to go to. That's her goal. Oh, she wants yeah. to go to the University of Hilo. Yeah, I mean, I personally, Science. like, um, I had a great experience. I actually went to undergrad at UH Hilo um, and did marine science there. And I really enjoyed the, the marine science aspect of it because um, we kind of got all disciplines of, of the marine sciences, right? Versus like marine biology program, you're only going to be doing biology classes for the most part. So we were doing oceanography, physical oceanography, chemical oceanography. Uh, we were doing different biology classes, all these different kind of um, disciplines of science in the ocean. And it kind of gives you an idea of where do you want to go from there. Um, I remember learning about algae at first, and I wasn't too fond of it. And I knew at that moment, you know, algae is not my thing. But uh, I do have a healthy respect and understand the importance of it. Um, but, you know, learning that still gave me a better understanding. Um, so I think the school does a really good job of that. Um, and then as a grad student, um, again, I've loved it. And a big part of that, like I said, was was uh, my advisor lab I got to work with. Um, so uh, shout out to John Burns. Um, he's been a great advisor to me. Um, he's, he helped me, you know, get in a position like this too. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things is um, UH Hilo has, it's kind of like, people kind of sleep on Hilo, I feel like, compared to um, UH Manoa, um, part, mostly because it's so small, um, so they don't think much of it. But, you know, you're hands-on, you're out in the field um, as a freshman, you're out in the water collecting things with the professors, you get to go on a boat for one class, like, you, you're just hands-on going from the start. So I've, I've personally loved it. Um, if you like small classrooms, it's the place to be. Okay. Um, so like you were talking about um, getting to know your face and all that, UH Hilo, it was, I felt like it was pretty easy to do that um, as long as you show up to class, <laughs> um, which, you know, that, that can be hard too sometimes when there's good surf or, or fishing's good around, you know, but. Um, yeah, Hawaii does offer quite a few distractions yeah. from going to school. <laughs> yeah, if you can get through uh, college in, in Hawaii, I feel like without distractions, you can <laughs> handle distractions really well because um, you've got plenty of excuses to be in other places, it seems, but. Yeah. 
In the chat, we have someone asking if the current watch on Nautilus is correct. It is correct, but I think you're probably talking about that it lists um, Bob Ballard as our watch leader. So our watch leader is actually shared between Bob Ballard and Dan here. And so Bob kind of is just popping in and out through all watches, I think. And he is on board with us. But um, sometimes I don't. He's not in the control van at the moment, so you never know when he's going to be in here. But he is um, all the time popping in and out. So he's somewhere on the ship. <laughs> he actually got the the jacuzzi or the it's the hot tub, but it's not yeah, hot. I saw the lid is off. Yeah. It's it's like a room temp, I guess. Yeah. Well, I remember when I first came on there, I was like, oh, a hot tub's like, no, it's a warm tub. Yeah, warm tub. <laughs> like, you got oh, okay. the warm tub going. I think it only, someone was saying that thing only gets used once a year when <laughs> Bob Ballard comes on board. Oh. But it looks, it's pretty nice looking out there. <laughs> yeah, we can, they're on now. We can turn them off. Hopefully we can get to some more interesting terrain. Uh, sometimes soon. Um, Lasers are off. Okay. So, yeah, for those of us who are um, joined us recently, we had some really amazing uh, igneous dikes uh, features with lots of corals and crinoids scattered on top of them. Uh, earlier in the dive, right around 1,100 meters, was a uh, real exciting moment. And now we're sort of coming up this mostly kind of sedimented uh, slope. There are still, looks like a few corals on scattered rocks here and there. Uh, hopefully we can uh, see something a little more interesting as we get to the top of this ridge. We're hoping that there'll be, uh, be some more rocks, a little less sediment, and <laughs> if our dreams come true, uh, a giant pinnacle that was mysteriously alluded to in 2011 <laughs> and covered with corals. But. Uh, We'll find out. Hopefully, uh, this traverse up sediment leads to something uh, really exciting. What is the depth you're expecting to see the the uh, increase? Is Sh there should is should be around 800 meters. 800 meters. And we're okay. we're like 860. We're not, at 846 right okay. now. Yeah. Coming up on it. So coming up. Well, we got a crinoid field coming up. It looks like. Yeah. Someone in the chat said that, um, liked our quotes and stuff, but said, you can never stop learning. And that, I think, is very true. 100%. There, there's never a time you stop learning. I guess when you die. <laughs> yeah. That's when you stop learning. <laughs> you well, learn you learn, you only get one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're kind of doing a disservice to yourself by not continuing to learn. Yeah. You know? yeah. You're just going to enjoy life and enjoy everything more when you, know, you just keep growing that way. Yeah, if you think yeah. you know everything, you know nothing. <laughs> the more you know, the less you know, right? Yeah. <laughs> I even go so far as to say, like, it's even okay to fail, to yeah. um, and to learn from those lessons. Like, if you don't learn from those failures, then you won't continue to keep on growing. It's not about getting everything right. It's about, like, perfecting it and, you know, trying again. It's a big thing. I try to constantly tell my students to keep asking questions. Like, mm. I'll be like, watch this video, what's a question? And I'm like, if you put, I have no questions or none, you're gonna get minus like 10 points on this 20 point assignment. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to, that's the, science is all about asking questions. Yeah, yeah in many ways it's more about asking asking questions than knowing things too. Yeah. It's like the more you <laughs> learn, the more questions you yeah, get. Yeah, yeah. And that's one of the things I really love about, about this job is that it's, always learning new things. There's always opportunities to try something new and um, yeah, and continue to grow and and sort of, yeah, explore. And so I think for me, that's that's always really exciting to, uh, to have a job that lets me explore my interests in that way and, and hopefully do something that helps contribute to our broader knowledge too at the same time. What's that black thing right there in the middle? Uh, maybe a fish or a shadow. Maybe it's just a shadow with a little shrimp in it. Oh, from the shadow from the rock. Yeah. A little red shrimp. Well, it looks like better conditions. It's yeah, it's start, we're starting to get a little... Look at that. 
getting oh, some more yeah. shots, Atlanta, right? Atlanta oh, Atlanta photo. From Over the Atlanta in shot in yeah, Atlanta. Cool. Satellite V2. Satellite V2, the at Atlanta. That is very cool. Yeah. Wow. I can get a picture of that. Oh, we got a. Oh, a under you. We got something Tripods. swimming on the right very side. Very shiny. Swim out of frame. Yeah, yeah. maybe a fish to the far right. Yeah. Or an eel. Yeah. Uh, like. This is getting a little more exciting here. Yeah, a little rubble feel. <laughs> a little more color. It's white, but it's color. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we should be getting to the top of this ridge some, yeah. sometime soon, I think. We're um, about 34 meters away, I believe. Yeah. Are there um, some basket stars on that rock right there? Yeah, it looks like it. Yeah, there's a lot more, a lot more of those starfish than I'm yeah, yeah, or more than crinoids. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's amazing. We just went up, you know, 10 meters, and the difference in biology is significant. Yeah. We have a comment in the chat that someone's 71 years old, and they're learning so much from watching us, and that the Google is getting a workout as they're looking <laughs> up new things we show and talk about. Thank you. That makes us feel good. I'm going to add your your comment into our nice thoughts little note that we have that keep our nice right. comments and thoughts to make us feel good. How's it going? We changed the world out here. <laughs> We're starting. Of course, you come up when it starts to get a little more interesting. Look at this! <laughs> Absolutely stunning. Is this igneous metamorphic rock, or? I just use words from geology. <laughs> <laughs> we did ask, someone asked, and I think they're, they're sad we don't have a geologist person on board. But I do have a question that people are saying, video visual people, time to explain how white isn't always a lack of color, but actually a combination of all colors, and that is very true. So I think you ha for there, you have to essentially look at the light spectrum, right? Because yes. you have light where white is the combination of all wavelengths of colors. But that's not true for pigment pigments, right? Mm -hmm. White is an absence of pigment. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? It depends on what that's you're... Right. So yes, that so does make sense. So when you're transmitting light, you know, but pigments are reflecting, right? So they reflect the colors. So that's kind of the opposite, right? Yeah, so if your shirt is blue, yeah. it's not blue because the pigment's blue, but because it's actually reflecting the blue light blue. back at you. That's correct, yes. So white's really reflecting all the colors back. Yeah. Black's absorbing all the colors. So it just is a, one of those things that likes to make your mind really confused of. Ooh, we got something coming up, some large structure. Reload. Oh, here's, here's a question in the chat. Since hydrothermal vents deposit a good amount of gold when Herc comes back from a dive around hydrothermal vents, would you find some flakes of gold in some nooks and crannies? I've never heard of hydrothermal vents having gold. Is that true? Uh, I think that they, they do produce a lot of, you know, metals. Metals and, I and think minerals. gold is one of them. One but of them? If, if I remember correctly, it's a very low percentage. <laughs> Maybe that's how we fund this whole trip and we're just not telling you guys. <laughs> 
I believe we are scheduled to do looking at some hydrothermal vents um, later in this expedition. So That's cross it. our fingers uh, that weather. No, we can keep going. Thank you. Again, just in addition to the gold thing, the hydrothermal vents around off the coast of BC and Ponte Fuca, around that way, there's a lot of iron pyrite or fool's gold. Fool's gold. The rock. So there's a, an area around there around a hydrothermal vent called the grotto. And when the ROV flies in there, it, all the cubic uh, crystals of iron pyrite just glitter like oh. stars. It's pretty impressive. So Simon, have you ever noticed any pyrite or gold flakes on Hercu on any ROVs that you've been on around hydrothermal vents before? So yeah, I have a piece of rock at home that's uh, one year old, um, and we know that because uh, it was uh, encrusted around an instrument that was a uh, that was put there the, the year prior, and we went to recover that instrument a year later. It was completely encased in. Uh, in rock from the from the hydrothermal vent. So you know that piece of rock that I have at home is one year old. That's really cool. Yeah. All right, I have a comment in the chat and this comment in the chat is asking viewers. Um, it says that per YouTube viewer counts we have about forty people watching right now. And they want to know what the age of current viewership is. The last comment was 71. There's 67. So this viewer would like to know the age of all the other viewers out there. So if you feel like it, go on over to Nautilus Live and type in your age. It's all anonymous, so. Uh, someone asked, Simon, are you sure that's not how you replace the equipment that gets melt studying vents by using gold that we find? <laughs> Sorry, say that again. So a comment is saying, are you sure that's not how we replace the equipment that gets melted studying vents is because we <laughs> find gold? Well, how, uh, how much, how, how hard is taking ROVs to um, hydrothermal vents? Like how is that because on replacing equipment damage it might sustain? So the, the temperature we found around the vents drops off pretty, in a fairly, um, short distance away from the actual hot water but the rocks around it can be pretty significantly warm so when we're recovering instruments from a, from around the vents we have to be very careful we don't lean the ROV to uh, for too long against the rocks we have had um, partial melting of certain rubberized components around protections um, around the ROV just from the heat from the rocks around the vent so the some of the water we've measured is coming out at 340 degrees Celsius. Um, yeah, and the rocks around them are, are also very warm. So we have to be very careful around the vents, placing the ROV that we don't lean up against it, you know, for too long. Um, flying around them themselves, they're in constant state of flux. So we go there one year and it's the uh, layout of the land could be different from the last time you were there. So we have to be very vigilant. We use multi beam sonars and sweeping sonars to assess the area acoustically before we go in uh, obviously with the limitations of the, the penetration of light through the water column so we can uh, we can have a good look with sonar and and uh, yeah essentially we have to be just vigilant uh, keep an eye out for overhangs and any changes to the uh, to the geology in that area I also got some people commenting back on the age of viewership. So we got a 53, 55, 20, 23, 26 from Brazil. Um, and another question asking if we're off the coast of Hawaii. And yes, we are off the coast of Hawaii. We're off the coast of the island of Hawaii, which is um, the big island, more commonly known as the big island. But Hawaii has nine main islands. Um, but there's actually even more islands than that, the ones we're known of. We also have Papanaumokuakea, which is a national marine park that is protected. But out of the main islands that people know of, it's commonly referred to as the Big Island, but it's actually the island of Hawaii, and you actually pronounce it more with a V than a W. Oh, I 
have um, a student who's writing in, Ms. Griffey. Have you seen dolphins yet? Yes, we actually saw some dolphins off the bow. I saw one yesterday. Um, another person saw one this morning. And then we also have a 66-year-old. I'm glad you're listening. I feel good that you guys are actually listening to me. Um, 15, uh, 56, been watching for eight years from Australia, and we have a 45-year-old. So I think we're spanning the age spectrum pretty well, 61 from Wales all the way from 15 to 71. California, three viewers, 46 is the youngest and 65 is the oldest. California dreaming. Does Nautilus sail back to California next? No, Nautilus is actually gonna stay out on the Pacific. Um, we're, the next one's still staying in Hawaii. Um, Jonathan, what's the rest of the expedition plans? Next year is gonna be a very exciting and busy year for Nautilus. Um, we're going to be heading out to Palau. And just in general, we're gonna to continue to work further and further into the Western Pacific. Um, I believe we have plans to go to, as mentioned, Palau. We're going to be going to American Samoa. Uh, it is, though, likely that we'll also trans back, uh, transit back to uh, work in Simon's Neck of the Woods uh, as we uh, continue our partnership with Ocean Networks Canada and uh, do work with their observatory network um, up in British Columbia. So quite a bit of transiting back and forth and uh, exploring some new areas, seeing some hydrothermal vents, if, if we're allowed to go back out to the uh, uh, Endeavor vent fields. It's always a spectacular location. And uh, of course, the, the unexplored areas in and around Palau, American Samoa, will be absolutely incredible to, to see. Yeah. That, um, they're saying that the Wikipedia page for EV Nautilus says that our home port is still LA. Since you guys are in Hawaii so much, has that port changed? Um, we have been docked in port in Honolulu a lot, but a lot of boats are different on the flag of the ship versus home port is not always necessarily where you spend the most time. Our, our home port was with our fantastic uh, um, uh, partners out in San Pedro um, with Alta Sea. Um, however, since we have moved further and further out into Western Pacific, we are um, kind of home basing where it's closest to our operations. So as Bob would say, we're, we're forward deployed for the Pacific now. Uh, we have used uh, Hawaii gratefully um, as the ship's home uh, for the last couple of years. Um, but where Nautilus ends up at the end of next year um, is likely to be even further in the Pacific. There's a a big balance between uh, the time and expenses of transiting versus um, where you want to call your home base. So um, I'm not sure where we're going to end up uh, by the end of next year, but that's all that's all part of the excitement of exploration. We have another viewers in from Palm Desert, California, and Sun is watching, is 27, and she's 63, and she teaches AP Biology. Mm. I teach AP Environmental Science. I like all the APs though. And then any, do we have any plans for the axial seamount? Axial seamount. I am not aware if we have plans to do axial seamount. I've heard it's really awesome. So as of right now, no plans, but Jonathan's Googling it. So maybe I'm he Googling, might end up Googling, making it I'm a Googling plan. Googling the heck out of this. <laughs> oh, axial. axial, that's part of ONC or outside of it. Sorry, Dave? Yeah, Axial Seamount is uh, off the coast of Oregon. Yeah. Uh, pretty much, uh, I don't know, about 100, 100 and some miles off the coast of uh, the middle of Oregon. Uh, we've been there several times. Uh, we're not doing any West Coast operations uh, for the foreseeable future, except for uh, ONC work uh, up around Vancouver Island. So I don't think we'll be there. The uh, uh, University of Washington Cable Network uh, does go to Axial Seamount and they have active sensors on Axial uh, all the time. So it is being monitored. 
We have a new fan, uh, Maria, who's watching from the Philippines. Hi, Maria. Thank you for being a new fan. And then we have a question about how Nautilus expeditions work on behalf of planning and contracting if they are from the university research institution. So each expedition is different and it has different benefactors per se. So like this one is being funded mostly by the U.S. Navy contractors. Is that correct, Jonathan? Oh, uh, Office of Naval uh, Office Research. Office of Naval yep. Research. Office of Naval Research. And then um, earlier expeditions, we had ones. Um, do you want to talk about funding from the ones for Canada? Yeah, right. so um, as I mentioned, we've had a, a long-term partnership with Ocean Networks Canada, um, helping them uh, maintain their, their um, cabled observatory network. Um, it's always awesome to go back out there and uh, see the incredible work that they're doing. Um, and but one of our uh, biggest uh, partners right now and, and into the foreseeable future remains uh, NOAA um, and the uh, Office of Exploration. Um, so we're one of uh, five partner institutions within the Ocean uh, Exploration Cooperative Institute, um, which is uh, based out of the University of Rhode Island, but includes partners with uh, uh, USM, um, uh, UNH, uh, Do you want to say what those acronyms mean for everyone? Else? Sure. Yeah. You, yeah. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. University of Southern Mississippi, the uh, University of New Hampshire, um, the University of Rhode Island, of course, uh, the EV Nautilus, and um, uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Um, so, in many ways, uh, like our our most recent technology, um, the application of like new technology that that was from all of those partner institutions. So uh, that was tricks, our last expedition. Yeah, NA 155. Check out the awesome work on that page and on the on the YouTube. But um, at, at uh, uh, NOAA's Office of Exploration, kind of funding um, the the uh, this Ocean Exploration Cooperative Institute has been fantastic because it has brought together. Um, awesome teams and awesome technologies to do more than we've ever done before. Like um, University of New Hampshire at the uh, Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, um, they have a fantastic vehicle called the Drix, which is a uh, autonomous surface vessel, or um, which uh, specializes in uh, shallow water coastal mapping. Um, but uh, we really pushed. Uh, pushed its capabilities uh, and its its advantages right to the edge over the last three years, um, using it to not only do uh, mapping, but to also operate as a communications platform for other autonomous vehicles that are exploring, and um, all while allowing the EV Nautilus, which has traditionally been kind of the mothership, just like here, right? We have to stay right on top of ROV Hercules because we're tethered to it. Um, we can't be multi-beaming or, ex or exploring anywhere else but right here. Um, so these future autonomous technologies um, will really allow us to be uh, force multipliers is the word for it, where we can drop off autonomous vehicles that help monitor other autonomous vehicles, which allows the EV Nautilus to continue exploring um, in its own way. So long-winded way of saying that the funding and the partnerships always um, is, is a really beneficial to everybody working in ocean exploration like we do. It takes a lot of hands to make expeditions work, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we have a third year college student tuning in tonight and was wondering if they have been any good whale falls as of recent. I don't think so. Anyone? Did Andrew know the last whale fall? I, I know I got a fake out earlier on that, er, er, a little bit earlier when we came across oh, the, the log that oh, made yeah, me think for a, good, a little bit that, that it was a, a rib whale rib bone there for a hot Dave, sec there. Dave, when was the last time you saw a whale fall? Didn't we get one on? Um, I think it was a Monterey. Monterey. No, yeah. we. Yeah, it's the one one whale fall that we've been back to several times. Oh, just I to thought watch. we discovered yes. some beaked whale, or you oh, we did. did yeah, oh, yeah. We, we did out here uh, down in uh, Kingman, Palmyra area. Kingman, Palmyra. Yeah, um, I believe. It was a skull, right? It was just like a, a just, bit of a whale bone. Just a portion, just portion a portion of the skull. It. But we did, we recovered three of them. Three of them. Uh, yeah, and three. That, and there were a bunch more. So not really a whale fall, but just a, a, a fossilized whale bone. 
A whale piece. A whale yeah. drip. Yep. <laughs> and then for the viewer, if you're still keeping track of the average of age, we have a 72 and 66 year old Robin Ivy. Hi, Robin Ivy. Joining us from Montana. And then we also have some viewers listening in from New Mexico. Hi. Oh, this is a great question. Are there only scientists on board or do you also have other types of crew members? Yes, we definitely have other types of crew members. Um, we have, especially our front row is full of all of our other types of crew members. So um, it's been a while since we did introductions. Should we go around and do another round? So for any new viewers just tuning in, um, we'll start off with uh, Renato Navigations. I think Renato's still out. Yeah, hi. Uh, I'm <laughs> stepping in for Renato. Uh, give me one second. I gotta okay. put in something, but then I can talk to that. The back of everyone's head kind of looks yeah. similar. Yeah, you're looking across the room. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. hard. <laughs> he snuck out on us. <laughs> All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Johan Becker. Uh, I'm a ocean engineering PhD student at the University of Rhode Island, working with ocean instrumentation and kind of developing new technologies on that platform. Um, right now, I'm working as the navigator and kind of directing where the ship moves and uh, hoping that we find some pretty cool stuff as we uh, come to the crest of this ridge. How okay. close are we to the crest? We are... We're about 110 meters from our target waypoint. Um, and once we reach there, we'll be at about 800 meters. Actually, we're about there right now. Um, and yeah, we'll from there kind of turn north and follow uh, the crest the rest of the way up which is an area that hasn't been looked at before. So that should be pretty exciting. Nice. And then, Thank you. Simon, you want to continue on with introductions? So, uh, hi, I'm Simon. I'm the ROV pilot for this portion of uh, today's mission. Uh, originally British born, now live in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, Canada. Um, work, do a lot of work as with uh, Ocean Networks Canada also with uh, other ROV companies, but uh, yeah, my first trip on Nautilus, uh, my first time piloting Hercules, so uh, having a great time. Uh, oh, another email. Yeah. And then, Tom, it's over to you. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, TJ Scanlon, I'm uh, the Atlanta pilot for this shift. I also work as uh, deck chief. Uh, and uh, yeah, from the southwest of Ireland, been with uh, Nautilus uh, OET for coming on a year now, and uh, it's been great. Hi, Dave Robertson, uh, video engineer uh, on this shift. Uh, we're generally considered science crew, uh, all of us here, uh, engineers, uh, technicians, operators, interns, uh, that kind of stuff. But in addition, there's also a professional crew uh, on board the ship that operate and maintain the ship from the captain uh, all the way down through his, uh, his mates and officers, uh, engineers, motormen, uh, and able-bodied seamen as well. So that, they're a whole uh, other part of the crew. Very important part, keep us running and afloat. <laughs> All right, Zach, on over to you. Yeah, hey everybody. Uh, my name is Zach Taylor. I am a graduate student at uh, UH Hilo. Um, I'm actually from Nebraska, grew up there, lived my first 18 years of my life there, and um, yeah, pursued marine science out here in Hawaii. Um, I've been here since uh, my graduate studies now focus on uh, using remote underwater video systems to monitor our reefs, um, kind of give us a new perspective into that. and. Um, yeah, just further explore the options with that moving forward to complement um, our current methods. So it's a great, it's a great project. I love it. I'm very excited to be here. Love this trip with how much uh, is based on camera and technology and how it can benefit. Um, 
learning a lot from people like Jonathan, who's uh, patiently watching me screw things up on the computer at times and <laughs> letting me fix it after a while. But uh, yeah, been enjoying it a lot. You're doing a great job. <laughs> nah, I just give him a hard time. I, I fix like 90% of the code I break. <laughs> 95. <laughs> All right, Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Dietz. Uh, I'm from the Office of Naval Research. So my day job is to look at different technologies uh, that we really go out to the ocean and try to understand it. And this camera technology is just one of those that is breaking through how we see the big picture of the ocean. From because essentially, as you see now, we're like shine a little flashlight around. Yeah. And this technology is going to allow us to take that flashlight and make a really big image as three-dimensional. And so we can really take a step back and say, oh, that's what the scene really looked like in high definition, you know, uh, six, 4K, 6K, depending on what the settings are. So this provides us a situational awareness that we never had before. And that's the type of technology that we're going to need to really understand what, this, what the ocean looks like underneath. Because right now, we know it at 400 meter blocks, but we're seeing it at, you know, millimeter scale at this point. So much different resolution uh, compared to what we know the entire ocean at now to what we need to really know the ocean at as millimeters. All right, Jonathan. Um, yeah, I'm Jonathan and um, I've been our, I'm the Ocean Exploration Trust uh, media producer and uh, I was a system architect for the cool, fun camera technology, big camera nerd, along with everyone else. Well, at least I think everyone else loves cameras, too. <laughs> um, Maybe not quite as much as you do, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say from a career perspective, um, I've bounced back and forth between biology um, to doing transmitter engineering to filming for um, uh, nature documentary style stuff. So. I'd say that my takeaway from that for types of crew and uh, only scientists is that um, it does take a big mix and can be one of the biggest advantages is coming back uh, with a uh, diverse career uh, behind you, whether that's engineering or teaching or everything. Um, it, all brings, it all brings together uh, for, for really great teams. My name's Daniela Griffey. I'm the Science Communication Fellow on board, um, and my day job is I am a high school teacher. So I teach AP Environmental Science and Marine Science at Radford High School, located in Honolulu, Hawaii. So we also have on our website, nautiluslive.org, a whole page that goes over different careers and job opportunities that we have on board on Nautilus. So it's, I highly recommend checking it out. We have a wide range of different um, career options and p p career paths that you can go. Um, we have a question of saying, who speaks the most languages on board? And I have no idea. I think one of our, our crew members, the boat crew, we have quite the um, multi-ethnic boat crew. So definitely people speak in Spanish. Our captain is Ukraine. Um, so definitely he's, several different He's actually countries. Polish, but he lives in Ireland. Oh. <laughs> he told me he was originally from the Ukraine. That's true. <laughs> okay. But he, he's Irish. He's Irish, <laughs> yes. Um, and then, Thomas, we have a comment for you saying, is Deck Frog happy today? I don't know what that means, though. Oh. <laughs> and then a question. The answer is yes. It is Frog happy? Yes. What's that mean? I'll show you. It's on uh, set feed three. Oh, is it mean like with the smiley face with the buoys? That's correct. That's the deck frog. Hi, oh. Hi Samantha. <laughs> I've noticed that it always looks like our deck is smiling, but I didn't realize you guys called it a frog. I didn't that, either. That's called deck frog. <laughs> that's deck frog. Oh, good to know. Um, and then another question from New Mexico. If we have any plans for Midway or Southern Pacific Islands, we're just at Midway. I remember we, were, we just um, dove the Battle of Midway. Are there any plans to go back to Midway? Not that I'm aware of now. 
but there's always, I'm sure, um, the open door to continue explorations and incredible sites like that. Um, we, we, we did have the, the, the true honor and privilege to return to the USS Yorktown um, and the lost uh, uh, Japanese um, carrier Akagi and the Kagi. Um, so yeah, those so are- Go check out our YouTube channels to see those highlight reels. They're very incredible, very yeah. impactful. Uh, that that battle though was obviously immense and um, that entire region is is still largely unexplored despite how many times we and our sisters uh, ships of exploration have been out there so yeah and so for other southern pacific islands there's plans that we said before of palau um, america samoa so we're always Always, we're pushing more and more into the Pacific. Yeah, and follow follow along always on Nautilus Live, where we'll we'll publish the up season, uh, the upcoming season ahead, um, as soon as that's firmed up. All right, favorite part of Hawaii so far. So Zach and I live in Hawaii, um, but any visitors? Have you guys been able to get much time to explore Hawaii, or has everyone just kind of been on the ship? I think most of everyone's kind of been spending most of their time on the ship. Um, my favorite island in Hawaii is actually Kauai. I love uh, Waimea Valley and I love the Nepali coast. It's all really beautiful. Um, it is known to have a little bit more rain than the other islands, but that's what makes everything green and lush. And so I actually live over on the north shore of Oahu. So if you like waves, that's also a really beautiful place. I'm a big fan of the Big Island. Your big Island? Big Island is, it has, it's so big, it has a little bit of everything. It's got five different climates. Yeah. <laughs> and then I have a question, how is daily life aboard the Nautilus? What do you guys like to do in your spare time aboard? I think spare time is sleep. People have spare time? <laughs> yeah. 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 Not much spare time. Not much spare time. <laughs> There's just, so, um, yeah, it's, Pretty much, we've been diving for roughly eight hours to 10 hours a day. And then when we're not diving or processing data, yeah. and when you're not diving or processing data, you're eating or sleeping. Yeah. So Or picking each other's brains about or things. Picking, that's, yeah, that's one of the fun Lots things. Lots of conversations. And, yeah. I'd love, to, I'd love to hear from Simon and Dan, who both have a lot of experience at sea. Can you, can you compare and contrast Nautilus with other uh, ships you guys have been on in terms of life, life at sea? Well, I mean, it, it varies greatly from vessels to vessels. Um, Canadian Coast Guard vessels up until this year used to, be, used to be able to drink. So you used to be able to have a beer at the end of your shift and uh, sit and relax. Um, most often, vessels work a 12-hour rotation, so you tend to be at work for 12 hours, and uh, and then off for 12. Um, after work, most people maybe hang around for an hour or two together, but then we have to catch up on sleep in order to get ready for our next shift. So, yeah, it's uh, the facilities vary from vessel to vessel. Um, yeah, depending on the country and its regulations. Norway, Norway has some great vessels with great facilities on board um, yeah and, and uh, you know it uh, again it varies you know it's uh, Nautilus is is nice the the, uh, the deck layout around the galley and everything is, is super nice um, yeah it's it, Yeah, and how about you? How does this compare to uh, other ships you've been on in terms of uh, just life hey, at TJ, sea? TJ, I think you weren't on SPL. Oh. oh. <laughs> Sorry, I was talking there and uh, I was hearing me. Yeah, um, yeah, just to reiterate there, what I was saying before was that uh, life on Nautilus here is pretty good. There's a great atmosphere on board, uh, great team uh, between the scientists, ship's crew, engineers, uh, everybody on board. There's a Quite a good commander tree. And um, yeah, compared to other vessels I've been on, um, like S Simon said, uh, every vessel is different uh, and, and every job is different. Uh, and uh, every every job brings its own uh, set of challenges and, uh, and uh, 
you know, uh, good points with it as well. Uh, yeah, I've been here a year and uh, enjoying every day of it. There's a question in chat if there's video games aboard. And I think some of the ROV kind of is a little bit. Do you guys think uh, R driving the ROVs is a bit of a video game? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, there's no uh, reset, and you can't respawn <laughs> where you'd like, so, uh, yeah. If it all goes black, game over, it's yeah. really game over. <laughs> it is, and it needs a lot of work for us pilots and technicians afterwards to try and repair it. It's, uh, it's, you can't simply hit reset and, and go. It's a lot more intense. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. So, I don't know about anybody else, but once I've done a... A few hours piloting the ROV, I don't really feel like playing video games. So. <laughs> <laughs> Staring at screens, we don't need to stare at any more screens. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. So uh, the, the last company I worked at before coming here, uh, we went, to, we were sent to Marseille. They had a ROV simulator, and uh, where we uh, where we used that to, to train on systems, yeah. and uh, that would be as close to, to, to <laughs> gaming as uh, as you could get in this in this line of work. Dave, you got a shout out. Good work as usual. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and then Zach, here, I'm gonna toss this question to you. Yeah. What concepts of chemistry do the biologists need to know? Do they need to know <laughs> chemical polarity and compound shape? Oh, um, to be honest, I felt like chemistry was more of like a, a class to see who really wanted who really wanted to become a scientist more than like I actually use it in my day to day. Yeah, um, just, it's just, you just had to get their organic yeah, chemistry. Yeah, especially <laughs> organic chemistry. That was one where, you know, you were just studying that hours every day just to get through. Um, yeah, it's interesting because um, I actually have a job right now where I'm working in a lab where I do a lot of chemistry, where I'm mixing reagents all the time and running these machines that require very um, strict methods um, to make things work. And so, yeah, I mean, you learn the basic concepts and the basic tools of chemistry, how to do things in a lab, you know, um, how to keep things sterile, how to do, keep biosecurity, all those things. So you learn a lot of things um, that you won't use directly, but I think indirectly it just stays in the back of your mind and it, yeah, it helps answer some questions, you know, um, especially in the ocean. You know, people wonder, oh, why, why is this animal doing this or why is this growing here? A lot of time it can be the chemistry of the ocean. Um, and if you have a better understanding of how that works, I'm just going to make it easier for you to really um, you know, dive into your question and think of any potential answer. So, do you know why chemists are such great problem solvers? Why is that? <laughs> because they have all the solutions. Oh. <laughs> great dad joke. I like it. I like it. <laughs> all right, we also had a question asking what is the max depth of Hercules and his max. It, a Hercules max depth is 4,000 meters. And then Atalanta, I believe, is 6,000 meters. That's correct. And then here's a question for our engineers on board. Has chat, GPT, and AI <laughs> made its way into assisting research? I'll say that I just used chat, GPT last night. <laughs> I had a problem with code. And ChatGPT helped me a great helped me save a great deal of effort really? trying to figure out. Really, I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. No way. You can copy paste code into it and ask what it thinks, and um, it's it's a remarkable tool. But I will say so. So my partner with this project, Rachel Simon, she's the uh, really the brains behind the operation. Has done all of the actual programming that has made this system actually work on board. Um, three cameras, synchronization, big files going here, there, control of the cameras. Um, the actual experience, knowing how to program and how to think like that and how to organize and serialize data, like that is not something you can actually replicate with a tool like ChatGPT. So I'll say yes, um, I've definitely used it, but it does not supplant by any means the capacity to have someone that's not just a programmer, but a systems architect. Um, that can think comprehensively about a, uh, a problem and uh, provide the solution to, to make it happen. Anyone else? Chat GPT? I know in I education mean, it's been becoming an increasing problem of students using Chat GPT or AI. But I will say, as a teacher, like I see students writing and 
in person in class and then when they sign in this assignment and it's like completely different tone and yeah. text and like there's like no smell spelling mistakes or grammar mistakes at all then it's a little questionable yeah, it's yeah pretty, I think <laughs> pretty easy to spot and i think if you're you're using something like ChatGPT, um you got to know what you're doing first you can't just yeah. ask it a very open-ended question and just trust everything right it's it's more of a, a helper tool than a do it for you tool yeah um you know like especially uh, john was talking about the code you get errors all the time, and sometimes you'll be Googling for an hour to figure out what the error was or how to fix it versus, you know, you type it in there. They'll give you a couple options to try. Um, so, yeah, writing-wise, uh, you definitely have to be careful because uh, it will turn you into someone you're not real yeah. quick. Um, and, yeah, I can understand as a teacher, that is a, it's a huge concern. And that's probably not a fun position for you to be in either to have to ask your student, right? Like. Um, so. I'm, I'm glad I'm not an English teacher. That's all I have oh, to yeah. say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then we have a question for if we have software engineers on board, what kind of projects do they work on? So we have like well, programmers. Oh, absolutely. I, I mentioned I mentioned Rachel. Rachel. Um, so we have currently two data engineers on board and I'm certain that many of the ROV engineers and everyone has uh, other people on board in different departments have their own software chops. Um, but we always have projects going on uh, for this camera system, as I mentioned. Um, sometimes scientists bring tools on board that still need development or integration. Um, that's a direct application of um, uh, software engineers' uh, skill set. Um, as far as data engineering uh, goes, as well as video engineering, um, the digital systems all require their own languages to talk. And when a problem pops up, um, the skill set of a soft, good software engineer that uh, knows how to um, approach those problems, how to speak the languages, uh, truly invaluable to, to doing the research that we're doing. Ignacio, we still haven't seen these pinnacles you promised us. <laughs> well, we're still not at the top, actually. <laughs> we're still on just one slope of the actual mountain. Uh, we actually just had a meeting here tomorrow. Tomorrow exactly. we may be going up there. To the I'm gonna top stop and around, so. uh, taking photogrammetry at this point because uh, yep. okay. it seems good. Yeah, yeah our depth yeah, right I'll, now I'll is 788 meters. And we have a question if anyone has ever gotten land sick after spending so much time at sea. <laughs> well, this expedition, so, we're only two weeks, but in the past, I've definitely gotten land sick. I can say that I have. Like, yeah. well, I'm not sick, but like when you, you feel get a little off, off, you start to like walk, like, you know, yeah. compensate, and then you're like, definitely so that was after months. Yeah. yeah, it's called dock rock. <laughs> uh, you can't walk a straight line. Yeah, I've, I've worked dock on rock. fishing boats where I've been on a fishing vessel for three months, and you get off and you just, I guess because we're so used to compensating for the movement of the boat that when you get off, you kind of still like, you're like, wait, you're trying, you're still trying to compensate, but there's nothing to compensate. So I've never gotten sick in the regards of like throwing up land sick, but you do feel a little off kilter for a little bit when you get back in and you have to, your brain has to reorientate itself. Yeah, it's only like a few hours. And then yeah, it's not very long. Work. No, but if you're seasick, that can be miserable. <laughs> So right now we're at the top of the ridge, from what I can tell. Okay. Yeah. So this is the tippy top, and looks like we're coming into some more coral. But um, with the amount of silt that's down there, it's really tough for them to grab Girl, on and there's live. not not much substrate for them to hold on to. No. And so we're at the sort of the top of the ridge now, but we're not at the the top of the seamount, which was what some of our conversations were just now with with Jason about potentially trying to go to the the very top and, and doing sort of a, a fly around that to Roger. map the, the peak in hopes that there's some more interesting features up there. Yeah, so uh, navigation has turned north, so we are making our way up the north side, up to the north to see what's at the very top. Oh. And 
Well, we have time to do that today. We got about another half an hour, I think, before they're gonna have to call it. Okay. So. Yeah. So yeah, maybe let's see then. Uh, lots of sand right now, huh? Oh, yeah. All right. It's getting murky too, a little bit. Yeah. Couple oh. sea pens. That's good. Swimming there. So here's a question if anyone knows. Um, why is the Nautilus registered to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, even though it was made in East Germany and its home port is in LA? So it sounds like someone's been looking up our <laughs> Wikipedia page. Um, that's beyond my pay grade. I don't know. What do we What do we have swimming up here? Well, the Grenadier. Oh, that's pretty Grenadier cool. Grenadier fish coming up. It's like a Grenadier. Yeah. Nobody will like this. <laughs> I know a lot of ships I feel like are registered to St. Vincent and Grenadines because it's like I think it has to do with taxes you pay for the flagship kind of thing or something like that but I'm not I'm not positive on that Dan's shaking his head he doesn't know so um, yeah I think you have to go up to the big boss Mr. Ballard, or Dr. Ballard for that one. Um, and then another question, do you guys sleep on the boat or do you go back onto land? So while we're at sea, we're obviously sleeping on the boat. And then um, when we're on land, it depends. I think it's when we're, because a lot of times when we only come into land to change crew members and um, some crew gets off and some crew gets on. If you are staying on between ship uh, expeditions, you stay on the ship. If you are getting off, you would go into a check in to a hotel and then fly out the next day, and then the other crew gets on. So it's kind of a rotation, and beds depend on who's getting on and off. So, yeah, the short version is ship is home. <laughs> the ship is home, yeah. Ship is everything. If, if you're staying on the ship for the expedition, I guess if you wanted to go pay for your own hotel room for the night to get, like, just off the ship, you could, but, yeah. No, not if you're staying on the ship for the no? next No? Oh, yeah, because of the COVID rules now, Because of huh? COVID rules, Yeah, That's COVID correct. rules now, you're not allowed to. Right. And then here's a question. What is the gnarliest thing Hercules has pulled up onto the ship? So I'm guessing collecting samples. So Dave, what do you think? What's been the gnarliest thing you've seen Hercules pull up? So I think it's just collecting biological samples. I, I don't think it's anything particularly super gnarly. Dan, have you, what's the gnarliest thing you think you've seen? Okay. We're doing a navigation thing here.
Jonathan, what do you think um, the strangest thing that Nautilus has found? The strangest, huh? Strangest thing. I think it depends on your definition of strange. I mean, there was that alien we found back a couple <laughs> years ago. I'm oh. not sure we're allowed to talk about that. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was still classified. Uh -oh. Do we have another little eel here? Um, yeah, it looks like it. Oh, yeah, look at that. There's been a handful of those guys tonight. A little white eel? What kind of eel? I was hoping they were hagfish, but uh, I hag think they are just some type of eel. Yeah, hagfish would have been fun. Hagfish are usually darker, though, aren't they? I'm, uh, Something they, floating in the that? fish islands there. Oh, yeah. there he is. Another one. Oh. Whoop. Another little eel just... Yeah, to anyone who's been sticking around with us for a long time and asking where the fish were, seems like there's certainly more fish up here. Yeah. <laughs> two. Two fish. <laughs> two fish. All the fish. Red Three fish. fish. One fish, fish two Blue fish. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got me. <laughs> In my bow, So here's the question. Do research ships, other research ships, typically have to deal with a lot of rough seas? What kind of limitations, sea states, weather are there for ROV operations? So I know that we, earlier expedition, they actually had to run to get out of the path of Hurricane Dora for a bit there. And so that was a bit of rough seas. Um, do, do. Simon, what, do you, what are some ROV limitations for a sea state and weather? So depending on um, whether you've got a, a garage or a TMS for the system or if it's simply on an umbilical off the ship, pretty much like we are here. So we're probably looking at seas around two meters, winds around probably 20, 25 knots as a limitation for, uh, for operations and recovery. If we're in the water, we obviously have to keep an eye out for future um, weather coming. So if we're planning a dive that's gonna last a certain number of hours, the weather has to be all good for that time. Um, if you're going into industry, then they, they have um, a lot more money to spend on systems and you can have uh, heave compensation on your on your winches, so you can operate in four, five, even six meter seas. Wow. But the recovery will still probably be the same, around two, two and a half to uh, three meters maximum for, uh, for actual launch and recovery operations. Okay. It's pretty consistent across the board. It's that critical zone, uh, the splash zone, when uh, getting the vehicle in and out of the water is the, the biggest risk is involved. Yeah. Wouldn't want to be in a control van in six foot, <laughs> six meter seas, that's yeah. for sure. Depends on, the, yeah, uh, depends on the vessel. We was on a, a Norwegian vessel one time and we didn't even realize it was four and a half, five meters outside. We, someone told us we had to call it on weather. And now uh, we're like, do we? And we <laughs> stepped out of the container. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the sea is pretty rough, but the boat just rode so well that we didn't even hardly feel it. Wow. I'm just going to uh, hold the conversation there and Nav wants to just do a check. So one of our viewers has said the strangest thing they've ever seen is a petrified coconut at deep sea depths, although they've heard stories about some gummy worm candies at depth. Oh, you know, last year or two years ago, I'm, I'm forgetting when, we, we discovered what was labeled as a UWU, an unknown white object. Unknown and, white object. And it turns out we collected one of these. It was a, a white rock in a field of nothing that was a right rock. And um, we ended up picking it up, and it was analyzed as a pure rock of phosphorus. Oh. Okay? Oh. Pure rock of phosphorus. 
and uh, a colleague looked at and analyzed that rock, you know, determined it was phosphorus. And the question was, how on earth or why was there these rock of phosphorus here? And then I think we discovered another one a little shortly later. Is it poop? Going there up. was <laughs> a record of a guano merchant going down between one of the islands of Hawaii and another. They used to harvest guano off of uh, these remote islands where seabirds would congregate and have for, for millennia. And guano is, is phosphorus. Yeah. Um, so it and is guano, hypothesized. for those that don't know, guano oh, yeah. is um, poop, basically. It's yep. bird poop, bat poop. And it's a lot of times used for fertilizer. So it's harvest to be used for fertilizers because your plants need phosphorus. It's a limiting nutrient. Yeah. It's, and so that was the strangest thing that I think we found. And especially since, and, and I'm remiss because I'm forgetting the name of, of the gentleman that, that did the research to, to discover um, the connection, but uh, he actually had sent uh, uh, Dr. Ballard um, a news clipping from that, like out of a out of a, a scan out of a newspaper that was describing the wreck nice. or the loss of one of these guano merchants in and around kind of the the area. same area. Yeah. yeah. So that was that was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, we got a comment in the chat. Is the Juki Jub Jub doing okay? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyone know about the Juki Jub Jub? No idea what that is. I I think it's an inside joke for a different watch on a, n a different expedition. So yeah. unfortunately. Feel free to provide extra context to us. Um, and then we have a question of how do Hawaiian folks travel between islands? There is no public transportation. There used to be a ferry that would go between the islands, um, but it is no longer in operation, hasn't been for a while. So you only way to get between islands is to fly. So Southwest Hawaiian Airlines, they will do inter-island flights. So I would love a ferry. There is a ferry that goes between Maui and Molokai and Lanai, but just those three islands because they're very close together. But besides that, if you're going to any of the other islands, you must take a flight. All right, someone said the guano story made their night. So <laughs> they're heading off to bed. <laughs> Have a good night. Sweet dreams of guano in your dreams. So uh, the dive has now ended and we're ascending. Okay. Uh, so expect you back up on the surface around 7.50, back on deck at 8. All right, so you guys heard Dan, our watch leader, that we are starting our ascent to the surface. So thank you for spending your time and pay, uh, following along, and stay tuned in for our dive tomorrow. We're going to be trying to, we're going to stay around South Point, but we're going to try and find those pinnacles from another direction, I think is the plan. Yep. All right, so see you all tomorrow.
We have someone in the comment that has said that Nauru Tower near Ala Moana is built with money made off of guano. So fun fact. And then we have a question. How long has EV Nautilus YouTube stream been live? So Dave, do you know that question? How long have we been live on YouTube? No idea. Anyone know the answer to that one? I don't know. So, been streaming for a while, I think. But that's you mean it. like uh, since since we've started the season, or or ever? I think ever. Um, I want to say that it was almost. Uh, it may have been exclusively through the Nautilus Live website at some point. Um, but yeah, to begin with, it was. I yeah. think YouTube we only added in the last uh, couple of years. Yeah. Something like that. It's a guess. And then we do stop streaming line live on the off season. Yes, we do still have 20 minutes of blue water for Q&A. Yeah. So we're not yeah. going offline. But we will still be here. If you have any questions, answers, please feel free to write it into the chat. And you'll never know what we'll see out here yeah. in Deep Blue, too. You never South know. Point we'll is kind of known for just random passes of things. So yeah. we we'll might get, get lucky. Maybe, maybe, we'll maybe, get we're, lucky. maybe we just give a good dive recap, uh, Travis. Would, would you like to just kind of recap the dive since you've been here all day and what you've seen and, mm -hmm. you know, give us, give us your feedback on that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Happy to do that. So today we started at the base uh, of this little seamount and the plan was to traverse up to the ridge, which we did, we did accomplish. Um, and so it was kind of a surprising dive for, for a lot of us. We had some footage from about halfway up that showed some, some dikes and sills with some corals and crinoids on it. But, and there was some mention of a, of a rare pinnacle that uh, someone was looking for but didn't see. So anyway, we, we dropped down at the bottom and sort of thought it would be kind of sandy and sediment, but it was actually filled with this really beautiful pillow lava. And the bottom was, was really quite stunning geologically. Uh, we had this pillow lava and sort of um, uh, kind of flatter pavement, sort of lava fields. And then as we started more, more upslope, we had really striking uh, dike and cell features, so these sort of long walls of, of rock that kind of looked like words that went around were ice cream sandwiches, stairways, <laughs> uh, the Great Wall of Hawaii. Uh, and so, yeah, really interesting rock features sort of sticking out the side of this seamount and sort of a lot of them were